And think about it from the customer's perspective. When they're looking, they don't speak your language. They don't know the names of all your products and services. And when you look at it, you're like, well, what are you telling me here? This is all about the drill and drill bits, the stuff you want me to pay for, as opposed to what I'm trying to buy, which is this happy ending, right? Uh, the outcome. So you start with your value prop. This is the Sales Bible Podcast, episode 285, How to Pitch a Compelling Proposal, an interview with Steve Thompson. Welcome to Sales Battle, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, sales babblers. This is your host, Pat Helmers, and this is the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And today I want to talk about the process of responding to RFPs. Those are requests for proposals. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it can be quite frustrating. Of course, the whole goal of an RFP is to somehow level the playing field so that you're not whining, dining, and doing other nefarious things to win deals. And the whole idea is that it's somehow more fair, but really is it? That's why I had our guest come visit. His name is Steve Thompson. He's got a new book out called The Compelling Proposal. And Steve believes the best way to respond to an RFP is to not respond to the RFP. In fact, what he does is he gives us in this episode a formal template for a letter that you can send them. And then once they read that letter, they ask to meet with you. He's also got his seven-slide pitch deck. This is really terrific advice So with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Steve. Are you ready to babble? Yes, I am. Steve, I'm really excited to have you here on the podcast. Last fall, I was working with a client, and we actually did a proposal, an RFP for a company, and that's your expertise, right? I got the right guy here, right? (laughs) Yes, I am the right guy. That is one of the areas that I do specialize in. You're you're, you're the author of the book, The uh, Compelling Proposal, Make It Easy for the Customer to Buy from You, right? Yep. Yep, yep. Well, Well, anyway, that was a very stressful task for us to do because RFPs are a lot of work. Uh, There's a lot of upside if you win it. But the likelihood of you win it, you're not really talking to people. They just kind of throw you questions. You can't really chat with them sometimes. You're not certain what to give them. And I thought, I'm not the only sales guy out there who's probably struggled with this. And that's why I thought I'd have you on, on the podcast. Well, it's interesting you bring up the, you know, the topic of RFPs because, uh, um, just for your audience, about half of my business, all right, is, I consult on the buying side with some of the largest companies in the world, um, helping them position, negotiate, and close critical deals with key suppliers. And I am not a proponent of RFPs. Maybe we could define. Maybe we should define that for the listeners. Yeah, a request for proposal, which is a formal uh, document that's sent out to a list of uh, approved vendors. And uh, you are asked to respond, and typically, uh, as you pointed out, the RFP is going to dictate what you get to talk about, how you get to talk about it. You know, uh, I mean, I started my sales career on the government side, and and the RFPs there would tell us, you know, that it had to be single space, ten point, or double space, <laughs> ten point, single sided, recycled paper. You yep. Know. Yep. You know, you know, all this stuff, right? Yep. Well, here's the problem with an RFP. In all of my years of working on the buying or the selling side, I have never read an RFP that told me what the customer was really trying to accomplish, meaning the outcomes they wanted to achieve. In, in essence, what it gives you is a list of specifications. So it gives you the answer, but you don't know what the question is. Yes. And that's why it's so hard to uh, respond. Now, the basic theory on their side is that, uh, well, this, you know, levels the playing field. We're comparing apples to apples, and that's nonsense. Um, look, when these buying organizations bring me in to help them uh, supposedly negotiate better deals, in reality, I spend probably 75% of my time trying to help them figure out, guys, what do you really want to accomplish? Okay, if you 
buy the perfect solution, mix of product, services, et cetera, implement it six months, a year from now, what's different than it is today? What is it we're really trying to accomplish? And you'd be amazed at how often when they dig into that, what they've got in the RFP is not going to get them there. Great. And, you know, look, it's an incredibly painful process. Unbelievably to, to painful. Construct them, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, look, if you've ever written an RFP or, or been involved in a team that does so, I mean, it's as much fun as having hot tar poured up your nose, right? Uh, this is the proverbial camel because it's being designed by committee and everybody's putting their uh, fingerprints on it. And sometimes this takes months and months, okay? Um, and by the time it gets near the end, the people in charge of it really don't care. They just want this thing to go out the door. You know, they've had it. Uh, and there you go. That's what's happening behind the scenes with RFPs. Uh, I, I really working with my buying clients, tell them I think it's a big waste of time. Uh, but there's a lot of people, you know, whose jobs are invested in uh, uh, that particular process. Um, the truth of the matter is, if you're dealing with clients that uh, – um, uh, are going to insist on RFPs, you're going to win or lose the business before the RFP comes out. Ah. Tell me okay. more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, for instance, uh, if you've been selling to them, help, helping them shape their vision of what the outcomes are they're trying to achieve and then help them understand what are going to be the critical elements of a deal that will help them achieve those outcomes, uh, many times they're going to ask you to help participate in writing the specs. And, of course, when you do so, you're going to write the specs so that they're in your favor. Um, and particularly, in, as I said, I started my sales career on the government side. Uh, the deal was won or lost before the RFP. You know, the people in the government agencies, just like within any company, they know who they want to win. And so they're yes. going to, you know... They're going to check the box because their company requires an RFP. They require, you know, at least three qualified bidders. They're going to check that box, but uh, they already know who they want to win, and they're going to write the RFP accordingly. That, which which so, always got me because I always felt like the the odds were stacked against me from the get go. Yes, absolutely. And and uh, look, I was VP of Sales worldwide at Westinghouse, and uh, I had a standing rule at that time. And that is, if we received an RFP, uh, what I called over the transom, meaning it was one that um, uh, we didn't know about, okay, we didn't participate in writing, then my standing order was we would never respond. And here's the reason why, Pat. We'd run the numbers, and our win rates on responding to RFPs was about 5%. One out of 20. Okay. I think, and I, yet, I think those numbers are about right. Yeah. No. And, and by the way, I found them pretty universal across my client base, uh, over the last 20 years. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a good thing that salespeople are like golfers. You know, they got bad memories. Okay. You don't remember the previous hole. <laughs> and in the case of sales, right? You don't remember the 19 that you lost. Everybody remembers that one that came in, you know, out of uh, out of the blue. But in reality, we were chewing up incredible resources, you know, and and uh, for nothing. So here's how we dealt with it. Uh, we had a form letter, and um, uh, it was always signed by me. I was the VP of Sales worldwide, and and the letter read like this. It it read, uh, look. Appreciate the opportunity you've given us to bid on your business. However, in reviewing, okay, the RFP, I can't determine what are the real outcomes you're trying to achieve. And because I can't determine that, I'm very uncomfortable that we can't give you the very best solution possible. So therefore, we're going to decline. But in the future, should we get the opportunity to meet with you uh, and, and your team and understand what you want to accomplish, my commitment to you is you will always get the very best solution that we can provide. And then I would sign it, 
And we would generally always copy a senior executive at the uh, customer who sent us, because the RFPs come from procurement or somebody who's managing a project, and then we'd send it off. So you'd also send it to like the uh, COO or CEO or... or Correct, or, somebody or, high up. Right, right, okay. right. Who I suspected had a vested interest in whatever they were trying to do. And um, so here's what happened. Here's, here's basically the, uh, the, the data, okay? About one-third of the time, we never heard back, which then told us, you know what? We were never going to win anyway, okay? But about two-thirds of the time, I would get a phone call. Now, I have to tell you, a lot of times those phone calls were pretty nasty. I mean, they'd start off just, you know, calling me all kinds of bad names and who did I think I was, you know, because I didn't want to bid on their business. Um, and I'd have to go, wait a minute, whoa, time out, time out. I thought I, uh, you know, was pretty clear. We'd be happy to bid on your business if we understood what you were trying to accomplish. And if it was a senior executive, they'd say, well, my God, we sent you an RFP that's two inches thick. And I go, yeah, you did. And we read it. Did you? Because you know what? <laughs> There's nothing in there about what you're trying to accomplish. And then they would usually get real quiet, you know. And uh, what happened the majority of the time is they'd say, well, who do you need to meet? And I'd say, well, the first person I'd like to meet with, obviously, is you. Um, but who else on your team understands the particulars of what you're really looking to do? We'll bring our team in. We'll be very cognizant of uh, their their time. Uh, but if we can understand what you're trying to accomplish, I guarantee you, I will always give you our best offer. But what did they, wouldn't they refer to something like that very first section of the RFP or it'd say something along the lines like, you know, you know, the reason we're putting this out for proposal is the current system that we have isn't working anymore. It's not providing us a certain amount of tasks. There's usually a general overview at the very beginning. Yeah, there is a general overview and it, and, and you're right. It usually has words to the effect of we're looking to improve something, right? Well, what does improve mean? I mean, everybody likes to improve, right? Nobody's going to send an RFP out saying we want to make something crappier, right? But what does it, you know, what does actual improve mean? And, you know, without those insights, uh, again, the RFP is more about, look, let me give you an analogy here, okay? Uh, this is probably one of the biggest disconnects in B2B sales that's out there. Um, there was a gentleman at Harvard University uh, named Theodore Levitt. Um, yes, and, yes, famous guy, uh, yes. Huge, huge fan yes. of this guy. And now you, you need to understand, this was 50 years ago. This was 1960, circa 1960. And what he said was, you know, people don't buy a quarter-inch drill they buy a quarter inch hole. And his point was people pay for the drill and drill bits, but what they're buying is the outcomes, the holes, right? And let's say you walk into a, uh, let's pick an Ace Hardware, right? Uh, with the friendly face and the helpful hardware man. Um, and let's say you come in and, and you, and I'm, I'm, I'm working there and you say, Steve, I'd like to buy a drill. Well, the first thing I'm probably going to ask you, Pat, is, well, what kind of materials do you want to drill holes in? You say, well, I don't know, wood, steel, concrete. And then I'd probably recommend a drill that has a certain power because some of those materials are very hard. Certainly, I'm going to recommend different drill bits for you because you need different bits for different materials. And then I might ask you, well, Pat, uh, where do you want to be able to drill holes? And you might say, well, Steve, I'd like to be able to drill them anywhere, anytime. Um, in which case, I would recommend then a cordless drill, right, with a battery pack. Uh, and then I might ask you, well, how many holes do you think you might drill in a day? And you'd say, well, I don't know, Steve. Some days I'd probably like to drill a whole lot of holes. And I'd say, well, then I'm probably going to recommend that you also buy a backup battery and a charger. So as you run the battery down, you switch it out. Uh, put the old one on charge and you can keep on going. Notice that whole cadence. And it was a very natural cadence. Right. All the questions I asked you were about the outcomes or holes. 
before I talked about the drill and drill bits. But so many B2B sellers do it completely backwards, right? They start off with the drill and drill bits, and sometimes they never even get to asking about the holes. So uh, anyway, this whole thing of RFPs, uh, I think it's crazy. Okay? I think it's a incredible waste of time because at the end of the day, customers are not in the business of buying. They're in the business of their business. And, you know, hiding behind some some archaic process like an RFP um, and saying this is how we do it, well, that's that's all well and good. But, you know, this is 2019 and business does move quickly. Things change. Um, and it took you six months to write the RFP. I guarantee you that there are things that have changed on the customer side that make at least some portions of what's in that RFP obsolete. So a third of the people. Ne- never listened. Ne- never, yep. never responded back to you. Two thirds got back to you somehow. Some chewed you out. Yep. Th- then, then what kind of numbers are we seeing? Well, then what what I saw out of that two thirds is about half the time uh, they would ask us to come meet with them and understand what they were really trying to accomplish, and then we provide a proposal. And our win rates on those were about eighty percent. Really? Wow. Because we were changing the game. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the proposal that we gave back to them didn't follow the format of the RFP. Okay. It was what my book is about, a compelling proposal, one that makes it easy for them to make a decision. So but doesn't again, that mess- everybody's got to run their business their way, but those were the numbers we saw. But doesn't that mess up government? Because they really do have to go through an RFP process. Yes, they do. And the way we'd handled it on the government side is we had to send in a response that conformed to the RFP because they had to check that box. But then you were happy to work on it because you knew you had actually been talking with them and that you had a relationship with them and you had Ah, a better understanding. We respond as they required, but then we would have a simple few-page addendum. And by the way... Based on what we know is important to you today, here is a second offer to you. And you'd be amazed at how much business we won on that second handful of pages. I'm not getting this. Could you say that again? Okay. Well, look, in the government, if you do not respond to their RFP as they require, in the format with all the specific sections and everything, you're not going to be considered. You'll be disqualified. Okay, we had to respond to the RFP the way it was written. However, because we got to meet with the customer and we understood what their real problems were today and the RFP wasn't addressing it, we'd send that response in, but we would attach a two or three page addendum that was a second offer. Yeah. Okay. And that, that fundamentally was, and by the way, based on what we understand your real issues are today, here's a second offer. Cool. Now they, they went through the process and they, you know, they got to check us off as being responsive, et cetera. And you'd be amazed how much business we won on those handful of pages that were the addendum. Wow. That is awesome. That's awesome. I just wanted to break in here for a moment to share a story about how when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an engineer. When I went to college, that's what I studied. My degrees are in computer science, and I went to work for Bell Laboratories, and I did engineering kind of stuff. I actually earned a couple inventions with a couple other guys. It was a lot of fun, but then one day I came to this realization that many of the projects that I was working on was getting canceled, and I didn't understand why. As I got closer and closer to the customer, it became clear that we were not selling them what they needed. And that's how I got into sales. I remember the second customer that I had, though, it was a lady. And I had been calling her seven, eight times, and I was trying to get her to close. I was trying to get her to buy. And she said to me, under no uncertain terms, do you ever call me again? And she hung up on me. An email came in like two days later and said, I'm really interested in your product, but I never want to hear from that Pat Homer's guy. It was a terrible situation. 
I was being a pushy sales guy, and it was extremely uncomfortable. That's why I wrote the Selling with Confidence online self-paced course. This course is designed in the same style of the Sales Babble podcast that you're used to listening to. It's got videos and handouts and PowerPoints and things like that, and it talks about all things like cold calling, lead generation, prospecting, presentations, closing, LinkedIn. It also comes with two half-hour sessions of consulting with me. Step up your sales skills today. Go to salesbabble.com and you will see the class. Start selling with confidence today. Maybe you could walk through. What are some of the components of a compelling proposal? Well, a couple of things about the compelling proposal. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with selling organizations, and I ask them, guys, what's the purpose of your proposal? And when I ask these groups of salespeople and sales managers, they look at me like I'm from Mars, right? Like I got three eyes in my head, right? They go, what do you mean, what's the purpose? You know, we get to that point in the sales cycle and we give them a proposal and that hopefully helps us win the business. And I go, okay, so your expectation is it's going to help you win the business. I go, have you ever read one of your proposals? <laughs> and then it gets real quiet. <laughs> and I always have an example that I pull up, right? And so here's the way supplier proposals go today. They either run the gamut from a two-page, what I'll call quote, which is a listing of indecipherable acronyms, product services, SKUs with pricing and volume. That's a quote. The other end of the spectrum is a young novel, right? And that novel is not about the customer. It's about the supplier. You know, it's all of our products and services and the offices we have worldwide and and the companies we've recently acquired and the awards we've won. And by the way, uh, if we're in the technology arena, you know, we're Gartner upper right quadrant. And by the way, every one of the suppliers is number one in their field. Now, you know, I don't know how the math works, but they've all got great marketing departments. Um, when I work with buying organizations, you know, for years, uh, they would pay me to evaluate supplier proposals, and I came to hate that job. And, in fact, I've been increasing my rates for doing that every year, and I'm going to keep increasing them until they stop asking because it's truly a waste of time. I can already tell them that proposal is all about the supplier. Every sales rep has their favorite format. And when they get to that point in a new sales cycle, they'll pull that file out, dust it off. Hopefully, they'll go in and do a search and replace and put the new customer name in there, um, make a few changes on, you know, volumes and configurations of uh, uh, products and services and send it off. But that's about the attention that it gets. And my point with the compelling proposal is, you're not making it easier to choose you. In fact, every one of your competitors is doing the exact same thing. And so, therefore, um, you know, salespeople tell me in the B2B space, selling is getting so much harder. There's so many more buying influencers on the customer side. And I agree with all of that. But here's the problem. Those people on the customer side are not aligned. They've all got their own agendas, you know, and yet we're – we're only going to do one deal with them. So, you know, what they don't realize and what I try to drive home is you think selling is becoming harder. Buying on the B2B side is getting even more challenging. Yes. Okay. And we're going to win the business if we just make it easy for them to feel they're making an informed decision. So, uh, sorry for my little diatribe there, but but now let me give you the components of a propelling or of a compelling proposal. Um, and my favorite format is just seven slides. And the reason that I like that format is I want to be with them having a dialogue, not a presentation. So let me run through it. Slide number one is your value proposition. What is it you're going to help them achieve? I can't tell you how many supplier proposals where the cover page or the cover slide 
is an indecipherable list of acronyms separated by commas, okay? And think about it. From the customer's perspective, when they're looking, they don't speak your language. They don't know the names of all your products and services. And when you look at it, you're like, well, what are you telling me here? This is all about the drill and drill bits, the stuff you want me to pay for, as opposed to what I'm trying to buy, which is this happy ending, right? Uh, the outcome. So you start with your value prop. Slide number two, you list the specific outcomes that you believe are important to them, that you've gathered through the sales cycle. And then you, in a very humble way, present the list and ask them, is the list right? Did we miss something? Did we need to change something? And you're in, well, you know, what are you doing right off the gate or right, right out of the gate is you are getting the customer you know, to realize you're focused on what they're trying to accomplish, the holes, okay? And that changes the dynamics here. Um, and they start feeling more comfortable because what makes a customer trust you? Not what you know about yourself, but rather what you know about them. And that's what we're reinforcing there. Then the third slide, and this is one of the, particularly in, in today's B2B sales when it's complex solutions and things, uh, it's one of the biggest steps I see missed. And this is where you've now got to take those customer outcomes and you've got to map them to the key components of your offer, meaning the key products and services, so that they can clearly see what, what, what you're putting in your offer directly, okay, impacts the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And this is a step that's missed all the time. Um, and therefore, they realize, okay, good, this is why you're putting it in there. Okay, I understand. Um, then the next slide, and this now is, is part of setting up the negotiation, we're going to share with the customer what's important to us in the deal. Now, by the way, this particular slide, you know, most of my clients, this, man, is, this is when they're going to This is an interesting food. slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're like, Thompson, you are way off the reservation here, buddy. Okay. Um, but here's, here's what's going on on the buying side. They're spending an inordinate amount of time, effort, and energy trying to figure out where you as a seller are coming from. Okay. Uh, and I don't want them to waste that time, effort, and energy. Okay. I'm going to tell them where I'm coming from, and hopefully they can help me get there. You know, for instance, you know, as sellers, we believe it's a state secret that the customer, you know, we, God forbid, we can't let them know that we'd really rather do a big deal, right? And for sure, the other thing we can't let them know is that we really like to close the deal, you know, this quarter. You know, who are you kidding? Okay, if these things are important to you, you tell them and you show them the love, right, that you're going to give them in terms of discount or additional services or whatever the case may be, um, you know, for doing so. But the fact is the deal's got to work for both parties, and this is where you are letting them know what's going to be important to you in a deal. That one slide, the transparency that's around it, um, for your listeners, if they ever try this, you're going to be stunned by the response of your customers. Interesting. It's a good yeah. slide. What's next? Yep. What's next? Okay, so the next slide is past value delivered. And this is where most uh, salespeople put up what I call the NASCAR slide. The NASCAR uh, slide, yep. Oh, yeah, man. It's got logos all over it, right? Well, the problem is your competition has a NASCAR slide with logos all over it. And it doesn't help the customer make a decision. Rather, I want you to put just a handful, you know, two, three examples of other customers who were in a similar situation or trying to solve similar problems or achieve similar outcomes um, and tell them, here's what we delivered for them. That's much more relevant. And that goes to credibility. Okay, because you are credible with a customer when you've been there and done that. Now let me get to the, uh, so I guess it would be the sixth slide. And this is really the heart of this particular approach. 
I'm going to put forth, Pat, that I don't care how good you are at selling in the B2B space, you are never going to have perfect information. And the reason you're never going to have perfect information is you're getting it from an imperfect customer. And as I said, as the deals get more complex and there are more buying influencers, they're all not aligned. And what all this leads to is a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And yet we've got to sell into that particular environment. And so what we do in the next slide is we tee up what I call multiple acceptable options. These are two, generally three options. Each one is titled as the outcomes it would produce for, for the customer. Now, we're prepared to accept any one of these, but we believe each one has a very different value proposition to the customer. And if you've got the right buying influencers in the room, you go through the different options in a very humble way and say, based on everything we've heard, these are three approaches that uh, that we come up with in terms of where we could, you know, get started uh, today. Tell us which of these is most attractive to you. And see, you're inviting the customer in to actually buy instead of you selling to them. And when you've got multiple buying influencers in there, my experience is during that one hour meeting, you're going to probably learn more than you learn the entire sales cycle because they're going to be talking openly with each other. Well, anyway, as soon as they kind of hone in on one of the options, the next critical question you ask is, how could it be improved? And they say, well, you know, we were thinking about, we didn't really want to buy as much of this right now, but we wanted some more of this. Well, we could change those. That's going to change the price. What else? Well, you know, we'd really like to have business critical uh, type support after the sale. Well, we can do that. Okay. Uh, the pricing and things will change a little bit. What else? What's happening here? is you're inviting the customer in to construct their deal, not your deal. And when it becomes their deal, by the way, the negotiation basically just happened right here and now. It just didn't feel that way. But when it becomes the customer's deal, you want to see sales cycles compress. You know, they own it. They can sell it internally. They can knock down those internal hurdles. They want this deal to get signed so that they can start achieving those outcomes as quickly as possible. And so that's kind of the heart of this approach. It's a very humble approach, uh, and it's one that's managing uncertainty because you don't have all the answers. Um, it's allowing the customer to buy. It's inviting them in to help construct the best deal for them at that point in time. And when you take this approach, I guarantee you conversion rates are going to go through the roof. Sales cycles are going to compress dramatically. And by the way, the last slide is simply uh, slide number seven is a rewording of the second slide, the things that were important to them, the outcomes. Uh, and it's the old adage of tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Um, I've had clients who've used this approach, Pat, on deals of 20K, I've had clients who've used this approach on deals well north of a billion dollars. That's with a B. The decision was made with seven simple slides. As you were walking through the slides, I actually, as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I got the book in your hand, and you have examples of the slides right in this book. Yes, um, I, do. I can buy this on Amazon? Yes, you can buy it on Amazon. It's the compelling proposal. There's Kindle version as well as paperback. And how can people find you online, Steve? Okay, they can find me at uh, our website is www.valuelifecycle, that's one word, dot com. And they can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to connect. I do lots of... Uh, postings and blogs on uh, uh, topics that I dive in deeper than than, uh, than I did in the book or certainly on this podcast. This is a solid solution for this problem. I love this, Steve. You have done, you've, you've done some really great work here, and uh, it's been really great having you on the podcast. Well, Pat, I really appreciate the opportunity. 
Hey folks, I know this episode went a little long, but there was so much great information that Steve wanted to share, I couldn't stop. <laughs> and I hope you found a lot of value in this. I certainly did. To connect with Steve and to find links that we mentioned during the interview, you can find him in the show notes at uh, www.salesbabble.com slash 285. And if you got any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out. If you're at the website, click the Babble Me button and that will connect directly. And if you could go on to your favorite podcast app and leave a five-star review for us, I'd really appreciate it. This week, David Reed reached out to me on LinkedIn. He says, quote, I like that you get right into the details and keep the subject matter relevant and useful. Good energy, no BS. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Word of mouth is the best way that podcasts grow. If you could share this episode with your friends, I would deeply appreciate it. Hey, that's all I got for this week. Until next week, take care and have a highly successful and profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com. Mm-hmm.